No matter how many pictures you have seen or what expectations you have, the very first moment you see African animals in the wild will be unforgettable. I still remember my first safari like it was yesterday. I landed in Nairobi, Kenya early in the morning and I went straight to Lake Nukuru National Park, where we spent hours and hours trying to get a sight of the elusive white rhino. In the meantime, I spotted countless zebras and impalas, the very rare Rothschild's giraffe, beautiful colorful birds, a lonely lion, and towards the end of our drive, there it was, a rhino and her baby, eating and playing in a green meadow by the lake, surrounded by a herd of buffalo and antelope. But if you've never been on safari, I'm sure you must have so many questions. So in this video, I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know about going on an African safari, including what the best safari destinations are, what animals you can expect to see, what to pack, and how to book your safari. By the way, if you're new here, my name is Laura and I've spent the past few years traveling around Africa and Europe. So if you like travel content like travel vlogs or more informational videos like this one, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. First things first, what destination do you choose for your safari? Africa is a huge continent with 54 countries, but not every one of those countries is a good safari destination. Out of those that are good safari destinations, they don't all have the same things to offer and there are countless national parks to visit between all of them, so it can be very hard to choose where to visit. I actually did an entire video that talks more in depth about this topic. I'll put it on the screen and I'll link it in the description in case you want to watch it before this one, but I'll still give you the most important information here as well. The best places for safari are in Southern African countries or in Eastern African countries. In Southern Africa, Botswana is one of the best countries to go to, but you can also find really good safaris in South Africa, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Namibia is also very well known for its desert safaris. In East Africa, Kenya and Tanzania are the most popular safari destinations. In Southern Kenya and Northern Tanzania, you can also enjoy the breathtaking landscapes of the Rift Valley. Because the predominant landscape in this region is grassland and there are few trees, it's also easier to spot animals here, and that is what makes the Rift Valley one of my favorite safari destinations. If you're interested in doing a safari in Kenya, I have a video that breaks down Kenya's best national parks, and that video has lots of very useful information about safaris in Kenya. You can also do safaris in southern Tanzania, which are also great, and Uganda is the country that, in my opinion, offers the most variety when it comes to safari and wildlife tourism, so it's also a great destination for first-time safari-goers. The most typical safari you can do is a jeep safari, where you travel in an open 4x4 with an experienced guide and driver, but there are other types of safaris you can do as well. You can also do a self-drive safari, but I would honestly not recommend these. There are some advantages to a self-drive safari, for example, it is much cheaper than an organized jeep safari, but there are also many disadvantages. Firstly, not all parks allow self-drive safaris. A couple that do are Kruger National Park in South Africa and Adosha National Park in Namibia, but most don't. You will also get much better visibility of the animals in a 4x4 safari vehicle than in your car, since you sit much higher and it will be easier for you to see animals in the vegetation. Lastly, I think the expertise of your driver and safari guide is a really valuable aspect of a jeep safari, and I don't think it's worth losing that to go on a self-drive safari. You can also go on a walking safari. Much like with self-drives, you won't be able to walk in most parks, but I still think it's worth trying a walking safari if you can. There are some disadvantages to it. Most notably, you will see fewer animals than if you use a vehicle because you cover much less terrain, and while it isn't massively unsafe, it's also not the safest activity out there. When you go on a walking safari, you always go with at least one park ranger or guide that can guide you and keep you safe, and you really shouldn't go out in the bush without one. I honestly really recommend doing a walking safari because it offers a completely different experience to a jeep safari. You're much more vulnerable and that makes it a really humbling experience. It gives you an entirely different perspective on wildlife and nature. 
Lastly, I wanted to mention horse riding safaris. So these safaris are for experienced riders only. I wouldn't recommend them to anyone else. I think you have to be very comfortable around horses and have good riding skills to do something like this. Anyways, moving on. Something else you should consider is the price point of your safari and whether you want a budget, mid-range or luxury safari. All safaris are going to be expensive activities no matter what, for a few reasons. Firstly, the entrance fees are usually quite high. For example, the Fichuanter Ambaseli National Park in Kenya is $60 per person, and they can go higher than that. Secondly, Jeep safaris require renting vehicles, horse safaris require, well, renting horses, and in all cases you need to travel with experienced personnel, and all of this costs money. The difference between a budget, mid-range, and luxury safari usually comes down to accommodation. In a budget safari, you will usually stay in camps, you'll sleep in tents and sleeping bags, but the safari itself and animal watching remains the same, which is why I think it's a great option if you want to go in safari but don't have a ton of money to spend on it. In a mid-range safari, you will usually stay in resorts, not the most luxurious ones out there, but still pretty good. Honestly, I've been to some mid-range safaris that felt super luxurious. And in luxury safaris, the organizers go all out, booking the best resorts out there. Sometimes you will go glamping, which is also really cool, and in some cases, instead of driving to a safari destination, you can take a small airplane there. I think this is great if you dislike road trips, although I personally really enjoy them. So now that you know what regions are the best for safari and the different types and price points for safari, where do you find the best safaris and how do you book them? Personally, I really recommend Get Your Guide to book your safari. They have plenty of options from budget safaris to luxury safaris and everything in between and they offer activities in lots of different countries. It's very easy to find what you're looking for and book it and the activities themselves are great. But there's another reason why I personally use Get Your Guide and really recommend it and that's that most of its activities come with a 24-hour free cancellation policy meaning that you can cancel your activity up until 24 hours before it starts and get a full refund. And I mean, this is great, but it's particularly great for safaris where you're spending a lot of money. So it's really good to know that if anything happens to your trip, at least you're getting that money back. So I thought I'd show you some Get Your Guide safaris just so you know what's on offer. And honestly, I am dying to book all of these. This one is honestly amazing because it combines the best parks in the Kenyan and Tanzanian Rift Valley. In Tanzania, it includes the Serengeti, Ngorongoro, Tarangire, and Lake Manyara. And on the Kenyan side, it includes Lake Nukuru and Naivasha, the Masai Mara, Amboseli, and Tsavo. And it finishes it off with a small holiday in Diani Beach, which is one of Kenya's most famous and beautiful beaches. This is the ultimate East Africa safari experience. It doesn't get much better than this. If you want to see the Kenyan and Tanzanian sites separately though, there are also these options. This one includes all of the Tanzanian parks I mentioned earlier, plus a vacation in Zanzibar. I probably wouldn't book this one because I've already been to Zanzibar, but if you haven't, I would really recommend something like this. And this one goes to the Masai Mara, Amboseli, Nakuru, and Naivasha in Kenya, which is a very popular itinerary and it's actually very similar to what I did, so I highly recommend it. In Uganda, I found this 10-day comprehensive safari experience which looks awesome. Unfortunately, Uganda tends to be a bit more expensive, but if you really want to go there specifically, this could be a great option. If you want a luxury safari, I found this 10-day Tanzania honeymoon safari and this 14-day Best of Kenya wildlife safari and beach holiday. But if you're on a budget, you've got this option to Lake Nakuru and the Masai Mara, which is much cheaper, and this one to the Masai Mara, Nakuru, and Naivasha. And you can find safaris on Get Your Guide, which are even cheaper than this. I only used examples in East Africa here, but there are many, many more safaris all over East and Southern Africa, so I'm sure that you can find the perfect safari for you on Get Your Guide. And the great thing about all of these safaris is that you can cancel them up to 24 hours before your safari starts and get a full refund. I'll leave a link to all of the Get Your Guide activities and safaris in the description down below, and it doesn't cost you anything extra to book through that link, but it does give me a commission, so I would really, really appreciate it if you could use that link if you do end up choosing to book with Get Your Guide. 
When it comes to walking safaris, there aren't many parks that allow this, so I thought I'd let you know a few that do so you can go from there in the search for the perfect walking safari for you. In Kenya, walking safaris aren't very common, but you can do them in the Maasai Mara, Samburu National Park, and Lake Naivasha. In neighboring Tanzania, you can do walking safaris in Ruaha and Tarangira National Parks. In South Africa, you can do them at Kruger National Park and in many of its private reserves, including those at Kruger, Sapi Sands, the Eastern Cape, and KwaZulu-Natal. If you're looking for a walking safari with a touch of luxury, then Botswana is the place for you. I did a walking safari in the Okavango Delta, specifically in Moremi Game Reserve, and I really recommend the experience. However, Zambia and Zimbabwe are probably the best places for walking safaris. Zambia is actually the birthplace of the walking safari, and you can do this activity in South Luanga National Park. And in Zimbabwe, you can go on walking safaris in Huange and Manapools National Parks. Lastly, because horse riding safaris are pretty niche, you're unlikely to find these on sites like Gadger Guide, so I'll let you know about a couple of companies that I've been eyeing for the longest time. One of them is Africa Horse Safaris, and their destinations include Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Botswana, Iswatini, Namibia, Mozambique, Egypt, and Morocco. There are also some smaller, more local companies that I think have great offerings, such as the Namibia Horse Safari Company, and not really for safari, but the Zanzibar Horse Club has some great rides as well if you like travel and horses. Something else that you should consider when booking your safari is when to travel. So this is going to depend on what country you end up going to, but it's usually said that the dry season is the best for safari, since it's easier to see animals on the lookout for water. That said, most of the safaris I've gone on have actually been during the rainy season and they were also great. I really loved them, so you can still enjoy a safari trip even if it's not the optimal season. I would still try to avoid the rainiest month of the year though since it can make the roads impassable and that can disrupt your trip. You should also know that there are a set of rules for going on safari. On jeep safaris, they include things like not getting off the jeep or having your arms or head out of the window. On walking safaris, and I imagine horse riding safaris as well, these rules are more strict. The rules are there to protect you from any harm and to protect the animals and the environment, so please listen to park rangers and guides for your own safety as well as for others. So a question that many people have is how many animals they will see on safari. Really, this is not something you can predict, this is wildlife, it moves around, and you can't always see exactly what you're looking for. Also, not every park has every animal. For example, Lake Nakuru in Kenya doesn't have elephants and Lake Naivasha also doesn't have predators like lions or cheetahs. It's also easier to see animals in some environments than others. For example, it's easier to spot them in grasslands than in wooded areas, and the time of the year that you visit matters a lot too. That said, there are a few animals that I would say you're almost guaranteed to see if you spend a few days on safari, and these are elephants, giraffes, zebras, buffaloes, and many species of antelope like impala. You'll also see lots of birds, and you should see monkeys at some point as well. Big cats like lions, cheetahs, and leopards are usually harder to see, they're more elusive animals, so they're harder to spot. Out of those three, I'd say lions are the easiest to see, and leopards are definitely the hardest. There are also some species, such as rhinos or sable antelope, which are really hard to see because they're so endangered. When you're on safari, sometimes you also go looking for a particular animal. For example, most people who go to Lake Nukuru in Kenya are usually looking for white rhinos, and sometimes you get lucky, and sometimes you don't. Generally speaking, people are always very pleasantly surprised by the animals that they get to see on safari, and it's usually much more than they were expecting. That was definitely the experience I had and most people around me have had. That said though, you have to remain flexible and open-minded, since wildlife is not something that can be controlled. Something else that you should be patient with is the time you spend on the road. So obviously, if you're going on a jeep safari, you can expect to spend a lot of time in the car, both traveling between different parks as well as on safaris themselves. And sometimes there can be long stretches of driving where you won't see any animals. A lot of these roads will be dirt roads, so they will be bumpy and dusty, so if this is something you dislike, I honestly recommend that you don't go on safari at all because you're gonna have a terrible time or maybe consider other kinds of safaris. Maybe luxury safaris where you fly to your destination instead of driving would suit you better. 
Lastly, I think it's super important for you to know what to pack on safari. There's a lot, so I'll do my best to keep it short. If you're flying into a safari park rather than driving, carry soft-sided bags instead of hard suitcases, since these are usually not allowed on safari flights. In some cases, your tour company may insist on soft-sided bags even if you're not flying, so make sure you check with your tour operator. You should carry binoculars if you want to get a good look at the animals, because although you will get to see some animals close up, in many cases you won't be able to, so binoculars are great for that. If you want to take photos, I recommend that you bring a DSLR camera or similar. While your phone can be great for capturing a quick video, if you want good photos, a phone or a typical tourist camera won't do for your safari. Personally, I've always used a second-hand Nikon DSLR and it's always worked really well for me. A lot of African countries are at risk of transmission of malaria and other diseases transmitted by mosquitoes, so I really encourage you to bring mosquito repellent, specifically a repellent that has DEET, which is a chemical compound that will keep you extra safe. I also really encourage you to talk to a medical professional about malaria medication and vaccinations before you leave for your trip. You could end up spending quite a bit of time in the sun while on safari, so I also recommend you bring sunscreen and sunglasses, and a hat if you want. Bring a bottle of water too for the trip, since you can't stop to buy it in the middle of a safari park. If you're camping, a flashlight and a headlamp can come in super useful, and when you're traveling to remote places in nature, it's always a good idea to carry a first aid kit and have a good travel insurance, whether you're camping or not. When it comes to clothing, I'd avoid wearing really bright colors, but it's not necessary for you to stick only to neutrals or be super picky about the colors you wear. I would suggest you stay away from camouflage and military prints though, since they're not allowed in some African countries. I'd also encourage you to pack layers, since it can be hot or quite cold while on safari, especially at night. And of course, if you're traveling in the rainy season, it can rain a lot as well. So I think that's all for the packing list. If you liked this video and found it useful, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications and I'll see you in the next one. 